we're going to talk to a man who needs no introduction, but in case any of you have had a few too many wines already, I'm going to let him introduce himself anyway. Roger. Really? Uh, <laughs> who are you and what are you doing here? Yeah, right, okay, so I, I'm Roger Smith and I'm a watchmaker based on the Isle of Man, making 18 watches a year. 18? Yeah. So not very productive then? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> How many of you are there in the team making these 18 watches a year? <laughs> well, there's 15, so it's, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a pretty poor level of it is. productivity. Do you... Um, would you differentiate your watchmaking to other watchmaking in any way in particular? So we, um, well, I mean, my watchmaking started many years ago working with George Daniels. He was this watchmaker who just completely blew me away. And uh, he used to make one watch a year. So really, we did quite well, actually, <laughs> Andrew. Um, um, he started this very unique approach to watchmaking, which we now refer to as the Daniels method, where one man will sit down and design a watch from start to finish. He made his first watch in, I think it was about 1968 or 69. And um, it's that idea that captured me. And it's that idea that we've taken on in the workshop where basically raw material enters one door and a completed watch, maybe a year, year and a half later, will leave the other door. And we do everything in house. Uh, that's the key to it. I design the watches, I prototype the watches. And then my team, myself and my team, we build those watches. I remember asking you many, many years ago, you, you might not remember this, but I remember asking you, do you have your own Roger Smith watch? Do you remember what your answer was? <laughs> it's probably the same answer today. It probably is, actually. <laughs> um, well, actually, I, yes, I do, I suppose. I have the very first prototype for the Series 2, which we built in, completed in February 2006. It's ingrained on my mind. Um, but yeah, I have that watch, which... Is, is nice to own. <laughs> if I recall, the answer you gave me last time was, I can't afford one. Well, I can't afford any of the new ones, that's, that, that's for sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned George Daniels. Uh, for anyone here who has spent their last few years under a rock, uh, would you mind just giving a little bit of background on him and how he influenced you? Yeah, so, um, well, as I mentioned before, George Daniels, he, he made one watch per year. He started in the um, late 1960s. And he, his, his world of watchmaking began because um, his world of watchmaking was changing. So basically, he started off in repairs. He was a trade repairer here in London. He used to tell me about, he used to go to Walsh's in Clerkenwell. And in those days, this was post-war, just after the war. Um, he used to go around all the tradespeople and buy a string of watches. So a string. Uh, a string of watches. So basically, um, they would get these trade, the, the wholesalers, the watch sort of retailers, the parts suppliers, they were a hub for the uh, watch repairs, the jewelers around London. And back in those days, nobody had any money. And so um, everything had to be done to a price. So they would deposit, the jewelers would deposit their watches with somebody like Walsh. Um, they would bag them up or string them up, maybe a dozen, 20 pieces onto a string. George would go into the, these places and ask if there was any work to do this week. He'd pick up a string of watches, take them home and uh, start repairing them. And in those days, everything was, as I said, nobody had any money. So everything had to be done down to price. So. Um, None of these watches were fully serviced at all. And basically, he honed his skill by opening the backs of the watches, finding out what was wrong with them, and only focusing on that component, or those series of components. And he'd do a sort of rapid part job, make sure he's keeping time, and uh, deliver the string or uh, string of watches back by the end of the week. So that's how he cut his teeth. So I think that's probably was to his advantage because he uh, could very quickly diagnose faults. He had a very good intuitive sort of um, approach to his watches and his watchmaking. So then from there, he then went into, um, he eventually went into restoration and um, he met in the, in the car collecting world, he, he met um, cars and watches often goes together. Yep, and yep. he met um, 
people who were buying and racing Bentleys and God knows what, and quite often they would collect watches, pocket watches. So then he got into the restoration of watches. And for many years he used to uh, repair the, the greatest pocket watches that had ever been made. And, um, um, and then gradually that developed. And there's one client of his, a man called Sam Clutton, or Cecil Clutton. He was part of the Clutton's estate agents. He, was, uh, he owned a, um, um, a Bugatti. He had a Bentley. And he had a Itala, a ex Grand Prix Itala, which I think was about 1908. Um, but apart from that, he had a collection of watches. He would only ha ever have 12 watches in his collection. And that, he had a very strict rule. So there may be some thinning out after this, <laughs> after this night. So, so the idea is you have 12, and you would only, if you, if you saw a watch which you really desired, then one had to go before it could come into the collection. And anyway, this guy, Sam Clutton, said to George one day, why don't you make a watch? And that's how it started. So by this time in the late 1960s, uh, uh, watchmaking was changing in Switzerland. They were, the quartz revolution was taking place. And George said that these damned electricians <laughs> were spoiling his trade. <laughs> and um, Very true. so he started to focus on making new watches new pocket watches. And in each watch, he would improve the escapement. He'd make tweaks to the escapement and improve their ability to keep time. And um, his goal was to compete with the, um, these new fandangled uh, quartz watches, which George said were great. They kept brilliant time, but they'd commit suicide every sort of, in those days, probably three months. Um, so, you know, what, what's the point of one of those watches? So, um, yeah, that's, that's how he got going. And I met him when I was a student at a college in Manchester, when I was 17, 18. And um, he just blew me away. Just a very impressive character. And he, he blew you away because you were interested in watches already? Or? So could I was, he juggle? Or? Yeah, yeah, well, maybe. He, he could play the mouth organ, that was it. So, <laughs> um, actually, no, so um, I was a student at the, is then a, uh, it's called the Manchester School of Horology. So this was pre-British School of Watchmaking, which we all know is in Manchester now. And this was a British horological run course. And um, I, my father pointed me in the direction because I was hopeless at school. And he said, well, do something practical, and that was that. So um, the first day was brilliant. I loved it. It was the best day of education I'd ever had. And um, I remember one day we heard that this man called George Daniels was coming to visit the work workshops, and I didn't know who George Daniels was. And um, somebody, I remember at break, we were talking about this visit, and somebody said that he made watches by hand and he's the world's greatest watchmaker. And naturally, I didn't believe any of that. Um, I mean, put, you know, as a 17, 18 year old, my vision of watchmaking was industry. Mm -hmm. You know, that was where you bought your watches from. Pause a second for the banjo music. <laughs> <laughs> Someone from the country. <laughs> um, and, um, this, this idea that somebody could hand make a watch, I just thought was impossible. Um, but anyway, next day, he, I remember he walked through the door and I thought, wow. He's a very impressive character. He always wore a, well, when he's on visits, his blue pinstripe suit, three-piece suit. And he's, I remember walking through the door and just thought, wow, this guy's something special. And then um, he, he went around the benches and spoke to us all. And I asked what was on the end of his pocket watch chain. And out came this space traveler. And I thought, wow, this is this this guy's genius. That's that was it. That was the turning point in my life, really. Wow, I mean, that, that's an introduction to watches. You, you see the best one; it's all downhill from there, really, isn't <laughs> exactly, it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned handmade watchmaking, mm -hmm. and this is something that I've only really started discovering in the last few years. That there's handmade watchmaking that we all know, and then there's 
handmade watchmaking. Mm. How did you find yourself down the direction of the handmade watchmaking? Yeah, I mean, well, it was all due to George. I mean, he, um, that evening he, he gave a lecture um, to the students and um, he was talking about his development of his watches and the development of the escapement, the coaxial escapement, which we all know today. Um, and he's just listening to his story and his battles with the Swiss watch industry to try and convince them the coaxial was the <laughs> way forward. And um, by the end of it, I thought, well, you know, I would like to be a watchmaker. Um, at the time, I was, when I finished college, I went to work for Hoyer in, um, up in Manchester, Tag Hoyer, and enjoyed it. But repairing watches just didn't suit me. I was always thinking about the practical side of it and the making side of it, which I really just loved. And um, I then got George's book, Watchmaking, mm -hmm. read that several times over, cover to cover, and thought, well, if George could do it, perhaps I could do it. And that's how it started. Bold move, bold move. Stupid move, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Day, yeah. So um, I'd really like to kind of paint a difference between the handmade and the, the handmade. Because mm. my understanding is is that most handmade stuff is really hand finished. Mm. A lot of work is done by CNC, even a lot of the onglage or beveling. Uh, and it's, it's a last pass by a watchmaker and their tools. Mm. What you do is different to that. Very different. Care to, I, I, yeah. I don't know how long we've got. It takes a, a year to make a watch, but let's, let's see how long we've got to describe one. <laughs> so it's, um, so we do use CNC. So, so in the early days, I was making pocket watches and I made a couple of watches to show to George. Um, and when you're making a pocket watch, you can work to tolerances of, you're working to tolerances of one to two hundredths of a millimetre. And that's fairly achievable with fairly rudimentary equipment. Uh, the problem is when you start making wrist watches, those tolerances move up to three to four thousandths of a millimetre. Mm. And that's when the problems really start. <laughs> because you have to repeat, you have to achieve that on a repeatable basis. So I made for George um, in the early 2000s, I made two wristwatches which are now known as blue and white and they're wristwatch tourbillons. They were completely handmade and they're a challenge from start to finish because you're always chasing this unattainable tolerance. I mean the watches work well but that's because of the incredible amount of attention to detail that you have to put into these pieces. Um, and as building those pieces, I, I sort of realised that if ever I wanted to build a future watchmaking business, that I couldn't really go down that route because I'd honed these skills over uh, the previous, how many years was it? Um, 10, 12 years by that point. And um, so we did go down the CNC route and that gives me and the watchmakers those micron accurate components. What's unusual about what we do is that we build everything in house. The only components we don't make for a watch are the sapphire crystals for the case, the strap, um, the jewels, and the main spring and balance spring. And that approach is unheard of in watchmaking today. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so that's our unique approach. So yes, we get the highly accurate components made, uh, but then the watchmakers, again, we give each watchmaker a kit of parts and um, it's then their responsibility to take each of those components and to take it from its raw machine state through to finished component in a watch. And that can take, on some components, it may take an hour, an hour and a half. Other times it may take two days to finish one component, maybe more. Um, and there are a hundred and gosh, how many is there? 150 old components in our most basic watch. So every single component has to be heat treated if it's steel um, and then finished and highly decorated and polished and so on. So the finishing processes are, you know, we, we black polish all of our steel work, which is where you get a, where you harden a piece of steel and then you grind it down basically on diamond compounds on a piece of tin until this component flashes complete blackness back at you and that's called a black polish and that's something which simply isn't attainable in mass production. Mm. 
you'll you can never get that true black polished finish all the gold work again is black polished so it's an incredible attention to detail and um, yeah we sort of combine modern CNC techniques with very traditional ways of finishing and building a watch and that's why we're only making 18 pieces a year. I mean it sounds utterly incredible I can only imagine the uh, the test of patience it is for a watchmaker mm. and a question I've always had is how do you stop yourself going completely mad <laughs> or, or haven't you? <laughs> no not yet no uh, it's uh, it's I mean yeah I've obviously got the right mindset to do this you know, and um, and the other watchmakers have. You know, we have had some watchmakers who simply cannot take it. You know, it is too much. They get drawn into this sort of um, sort of cycle of finishing and refinishing until there's no component left. You know, you you <laughs> have to be able to um, at some point you have to be able to say, well, that is as good as I will ever get that component. And you have to be able to draw the line and move on to the next next components, and that's just down to experience. But of course, yeah, we all have this obs a slight obsessive, you know, um, yeah, sort of take on watchmaking. And whenever we deliver a watch, whenever I deliver a watch, I look at it, and I'm always blown away by the quality and standard that the guys in the workshop achieved. But you know, you're always looking to improve that. So there is this continuous cycle of improvement that goes on and how can we make that watch better and the series six we delivered the first piece in so series two in two th we delivered the first piece in 2006 and we're still refining that watch you know we're still improving it and it's that continual improvement that i enjoy i think that's probably something amongst all of us we're looking to improve our collections you're looking to improve your watch. Hopefully mm. we can make that meet in the middle and I will get one of your watches mm. someday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to be the case, uh, not for want of trying. Um, but you mentioned the coaxial escapement. Before we talk about what that is and how that differs from an, an ordinary lever escapement, do you get bored of people asking you about George Daniels? Um, not at all. No, I mean he's a remarkable character and I wouldn't be here today without, without meeting him. So, um, yeah, I'm hugely associated with him, and thank goodness I am, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, he was, he was, and still is, a huge figure in my life. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's great. It's, it's nice after all these years, you've, oh, you've still got that in there yeah, for him, yeah, you know. Yeah, very much so. Pour one out for George. Yeah. Um, so you, you have worked on the coaxial escapement. George has developed the coaxial escapement. Talk about how you've improved it, because everything can always be better. Mm. Uh, but why don't you try and tell us, without any kind of visual aid whatsoever, <laughs> how a coaxial escapement differs from a Swiss lever escape? Right. So, um, so the key difference is how the power is, to, is transmitted from the trainer wheels through the escapement to the balance wheel. Um, in the lever escapement, you have uh, basically you have a tooth which hits a jewel and then this this tooth slides down this inclined face and as it slides down this inclined face it imparts energy through to the balance wheel so um the lever scheme was invented in what was it about 1750 odd so by, so by, by uh, thomas yeah, Munch. Yeah. and it's it it's not really improved that much since then. It, its main drawback is this sliding action, this sliding friction. And with all lever escapements, they are completely reliant upon lubrication to make them work efficiently. So um, with the coaxial escapement, you have uh, a tooth that hits the jewel and simply pushes it away. And it's just a simple pushing action. And that's how the power is delivered. So. In theory, you don't have to lubricate the coaxial escapement. It's a dry escapement. That's how it was designed. Um, sorry. I was going to say, I heard a, a lovely metaphor about a door. A door, right. So when you're home tonight or when you're walking out of here, um, <laughs> if you want to experience the difference between coaxial 
and a lever escapement. So if you walk out of that door there, if you want to experience a lever escapement, put your hand by the hinge side and push the door forward. And you'll experience as your hand slides down the door, you'll feel the friction and the effort to, um, to push that door open. If you want to experience the action of a coaxial escapement, go right for the end where the, brass, where the steel plate is and just push the door and walk through. And that's the key difference. You'll notice with a coaxial that there's no real sliding action when you're walking through that door. So I want to see everyone have a go there. <laughs> <laughs> it might take a while yeah. for everyone to leave. Well, there's a few that. doors, actually. I've noticed there's, uh, there's eight doors to have a go of. And does that, because that's, that's quite a dramatic difference. I often yeah. open doors like that, because I'm just contrary. Yes. But is, is the difference between those two things, does that scale down to a lever escape versus coaxial? Is it really that dramatic? Yeah, yeah, it is. We, um, so, um, so George, he designed it the escapement and he knew it was a very efficient escapement but at no point could he ever um, explain how efficient it was and the reason was because throughout his career he made eight watches which contained the coaxial escapement and each one of these watches was different so he had nothing to base his methodolo methodology on. Uh, what we've been able to do with the with our work is We've created over 120 pieces now um, since 2006, um, all with a coaxial escapement. And we've had a repeatable process that we've been able to trial these escapements in and improve it. And um, throughout that period, um, the efficiency has increased hugely due to my development of the escapement. And um, I'm not sure if many of you here are watchmakers, but in repairing, uh, when I used to do trade repairs, as George did, um, if you had a particularly ropey watch in, one which was on its last legs, you know, it really needed a bit of a kick, a boost. You'd put a main, stronger mainspring in, just to give it that little, <laughs> little bit of a kick. Is and that the sawdust in the gearbox watchmaker? Kind of, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. So you'd put a, a mainspring strength in, which was half a size larger than the one that was meant to be in the watch. Yep. And that would just give it a little bit of a boost to keep it going for the next 10 years or so. <laughs> and um, um, over the development of the coaxial, we've, we've decreased the mainspring strength by eight half sizes, by eight of these oh, sort wow. of divisions. And um, it, it, it's incredible. And, Every single change I've done to the coaxial has resulted in a reduction in mainspring strength. And so it's changed my view, as, view towards the coaxial. And um, George always used to say it's about, um, um, it's about precision, which of course is important. But um, my take on it now is, is what can a great escapement do for the watch as a whole? You know, his was always about the timekeeping. And I think what this development has proven is that a really great escapement can benefit the watch mechanism as a whole in terms of reducing friction and power. So one of our watches, I mean, the normal service interval, I think, is it about five years now, mm -hmm. you know, for a watch? Uh, we think we're at about 10 years for a service interval. We're hoping we could easily get that to 20 years between for servicing. And that's simply because there's so little power going through this watch now to drive the escapement. So you've got less wear and tear in the winding mechanism, barrels, train, and escapement. So that's kind of our, our goal that we're trying to reach. So you're so busy making watches, you don't have time to service them. So you've made exactly, the watches, haven't yeah. you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, so you, you, you looked at the coaxial escapement, what is considered one of the greatest achievements in ever since, yeah. the, since the Swiss lever yeah. and you looked at it and thought nah I can do better than that <laughs> that's how how did you improve it how did you find that performance gain so is um so just in case George is listening I haven't changed the um, <laughs> um it is still George's coaxial escapement it's still exactly the same geometry we've tweaked some of it but the principle is exactly the same but what 
uh, those 120 watches that we've built as what it's allowed me to do is to develop the escape and to, re and to refine it. So um, initially, when I first started making the escapement, I started designing it in 2005. And um, um, it's the first time anybody had ever designed a production watch around George's escapement. So the very first, if you like, mass-produced coaxial watches uh, was a an Amiga which they based on the 2892 which is a Libra scheme watch um, and I sort of felt it's a good watch and it works and they still perform very well but I always thought that if you're going to design a new watch for a new escape you you know the, the, the power requirements would be much different um, this is a longer story, this, isn't it? <laughs> I started off with um, two wheels, basically, basically for the co coaxial. That's how George initially designed it. So you have a lower wheel, a locking wheel, and then above it, you have an impulse wheel. And um, we were having great challenges trying to make these escapements, escape wheels. I mean, real, you know, even though we were using some CNC equipment, super, the best CNC equipment you can buy, the tolerance of the, of the coaxial are really really challenging and um, every single watch we made um, I remember we've made when we first started delivering our series 2 in 2006 we started building nine watches and I noticed straight away that maybe two or three or four of those would go together very quickly and we could bring them to time very efficiently others we were just chasing our tails and struggling and so on and this process went on and I eventually thought that, you know, maybe the accuracy of the scheme just wasn't right. It wasn't good enough. So how can we improve it? How can we improve the way we make the escape? And I had this idea in the middle of the night, out of sheer frustration, that perhaps if we can incorporate the upper wheel with the lower wheel, that would improve the accuracy. And... I remember we went, I went into the workshop the next day, drew up the new escape wheel within about an hour. We had the new escape wheel actually made by lunchtime and we had it in a watch that afternoon. And the transformation was phenomenal. And we were able to bring that, time, that watch to time you know, in a greatly reduced time. And I realized that what was happening was that um, the way we were making them we could not guarantee that the upper sets of teeth, the tips of those upper teeth, were concentric with the lower teeth. Uh, because you had basically two wheels mounted on a common arbor. Um, and that was the real challenge. But not only were they not concentric, it's very difficult to get the angular orientation of the two sets of teeth together. So I f my idea was that if you could machine the whole, we whole wheel, in one single machining process so that you had vertical pillar teeth um, mounted on the lower wheel then you could guarantee total concentricity between the lower teeth and what was the upper teeth and then the correct angular orientation and it was a real game changer and suddenly we, as I said we noticed we were improving the rate of timekeeping and then we started playing around with the lightness of the components and I'd look at the designs and start shaving weight off the components and how can we make it them more efficient. And with every single change we made, we then began to see a reduction in the mainspring strength. And that was the start of this process and I felt that we were onto something then. Um, and then fast forward another few years, I think it's 2010, I came up with the idea of a very lightweight escape wheel I think is about 23 percent lighter and again that was a that was a real game changer suddenly I don't know I think we reduced the strength by one and a half strengths um, and then the next phase came when I said well we'd improve the efficiency of that escapement of that escapement so much what would happen if we were to reduce the actual size scale of the whole escapement at that point, our escape wheels were six mil diameter, and I 
don't know why, but I thought, well, if we reduce it to four and a half millimeters diameter, let's see what that does. Um, and it was, again, a massive, massive improvement. Then we really did re start reducing the size of the mainspring. So, yeah, it just goes on and we're still here. We've got another, another version coming out later this year with another improvement. Um, it's never ending. It sounds like you're the kind of person that's never quite satisfied with what they've achieved so far. Yeah, There's yeah. always a, another yeah, thing. Yeah. And it sounds like, actually, because you, you look at the watches that you produce and they are very, very traditional in their appearance, mm. but it, it, it sounds more like the, the prototyping process of a Formula One team, mm. shaving off weight, re mm. re re refining the geometry, looking for that small performance increment. Because yeah. you could have kept the one from 10 yeah. years ago and most people wouldn't have been any the wiser, <laughs> right? So what, what's that drive? Is it, is it just a personal pursuit of perfection that keeps you going? Yeah, it is. I mean, I do, I do enjoy that. That's, I'm a... I suppose a mechanic at heart and um, it is about just constantly trying to improve make the product better and you know if we were to look at one of our early watches with what we're doing today even though it's the same basic design everything's changed in the whole watch it's a completely different animal to what we were making back in 2006 and I enjoy that development side of it it's just something I well I think we all want to improve don't we you know, oh, think, some of us are a bit lazier than yeah. that. Good, good enough is good enough. Yeah. Um, and you've, I mean, it, you guys have got email signatures. Some of you might have BSC honours after that. This guy has OBE. That's pretty impressive. What, what was, uh, what was uh, that uh, thing? Somebody said to me, other buggers' efforts. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was it receiving an award like that for the work that other people have done? Yeah. It, it, I mean, yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> Um, it, it was brilliant. It is great. It's wonderful. I mean, um, yeah, to be recognised for that, for I mean, for services to British watchmaking. Um, yeah, it's very nice. I enjoyed <laughs> very, it. Very nice day. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, it's it's a gentleman over the said well deserved. So there you go. There's there's one person there who thinks you, were, you. you deserved it. Um, you mentioned the British watchmaking and the development of British watchmaking, the pursuit of that. You're here talking to me not necessarily because you've got a whole ton of watches you need to sell. That's pretty well taken care of. People buy your watches mm. and there are a big queue of people looking mm. for those. But there are other watchmakers in the UK as well. And for those of you who haven't seen, I'm wearing a little badge here. It says British on it and it's not because I'm a racist. It's because <laughs> it's for the British Watch and Clockmakers Alliance, which is a project that you have been working on with a, with a group of other people. Mm. Tell us about that. Yes, so the, uh, the Alliance of British Watch and Clock Makers, that started, uh, we started having conversations in, I think it's 2018. And um, for a while I'd been involved, um, yeah, I mean, I'd been involved with, in watchmaking all my life. And um, I was going to Salon QP, which no longer exists. Um, but I was meeting other people and chatting to them and I was getting a sense that there was lots happening in British watchmaking today but it really wasn't being talked about in in the media or in the watch media or amongst other collectors and enthusiasts and um, I bumped into Mike France from Christopher Ward mm -hmm. and I'd, got, I'd gotten to know Mike relatively well um, and I was having a bit of a whinge thon to him about this, this sort of problem. <laughs> and he said, I agree, you know, there is a lot going on in British watchmaking. Let's try and, um, well, I said, yeah, you know, I think we need to do something to try and shine some light on it. Uh, Mike was hugely supportive. We started having meetings. Um, and um, I think it's almost two years later, was it? Um, in 2019, we launched it. Was it two? Alistair. 20. 20, thank you. So um, in 2020, we, we launched the Alliance of British Watchmakers. And um, I remember when we, we, we were um, chatting before it was launched, um, we, we hoped we may get 20 people on board. We thought, gosh, you know, forget. No, I think it's a dozen. We were all having bets how many watchmakers, you know, uh, watchmaking companies we may get on board. Um, and thought, we thought if we get a dozen companies on board, we will be doing really well. We will have achieved everything we wanted. Anyway, here we are 
2023, we've got over 75 train members now. And it's, it's been really, I mean, even for me, you know, it's been fascinating because we now know there is an industry out there. We're under no illusion. It's a small industry. Uh, one of the first jobs we did was a bellwether report into the size and scope of the industry. We got uh, KPMG to, to look into the sector to find out what it, what it was. Um, that had never been done before. Um, so as I say, now we know we have a 150 million uh, pound industry. Uh, we have a project billion, uh, which we're aiming to. And what we're trying to do, well, what we are doing is, is making sure there's a conversation now with the journalists. Uh, we're also talking amongst ourselves and trying to work out how we can all work together to help to promote and grow the sector. Um, and we're, yeah, I mean, it, it's still very exciting. You know, we're, we're still at the early stages, really. We're also on the verge of having conversations with the educators because obviously we need to make sure there's the right skill level within the sector to support what it is today. And, um, you know, as I say, we're under no illusion. You know, we are not mass manufacturers. We are, there is no real manufacturing base left in Britain. <coughs> We've got to be honest about that. Um, but we're now in a good position to be able to support and try and nurture and push forward and build what is a wonderful sector? I mean, you're all here because you're interested in watches. And um, it's, it's, it's been very good for me, the watchmaking world, and you know, it can be for many, many other people. I heard a story, and you have to tell me whether it's true or not, that you approached the British government about the watch industry, and they said there wasn't one. Uh, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you've got your work cut yeah. out for you a little yeah. bit there. But actually now we are on the uh, government economic sector and we are in conversations um, about how the government can support and help our industry. And we're chatting amongst shoemakers and various other manufacturing bases within Britain who all have the same issues. You know, it's all about supply and demand and trying to bring some manufacturing back to um, back to Britain. And you have to be at the table in order to try and progress that sector. So it's really, it's fascinating. Yeah, really great. And you lot all thought this was free, right? <laughs> but actually, if you want to join the British Watch and Clockmakers Alliance, uh, you can Google what I just said. It's £55 for a year's membership. Uh, I haven't been paid or asked to say this, but I've recently joined up myself. You get a lovely pin. The main reason I want you to join is because you hand sign all the certificates, don't you? I do, yes. So yes. if you... <laughs> you see where I'm going yeah. with this? Uh, but I, I think it's an absolutely wonderful project, and I've had the immense privilege over the last few years to discover some of these independent brands and realise that... You, know, you mentioned Mike France and, yeah. and what Christopher Ward have done with the Bel yeah. Canto, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. For us... You go, hello, I can have awesome watchmaking for not as much money as, as the other brands are charging. Mm -hmm. And it, it, to me, it feels like not a resurgence of British watchmaking in the past, yeah. but something a bit different, a bit yeah. more technological, knowledge-based, a bit like our Formula One yeah. industry, yeah. of which we have a member here. I'm not going to point some out because I'd be embarrassed. Um, is, is that the kind of the, the thing you're going for? You seem to love the technological, the engineering side. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I, I come... I've come from a very traditional watchmaking background. I did a British Horological Institute course and I used to be involved in the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers and it is all about tradition, tradition, <laughs> tradition. Um, but actually, you know, as I say, it's been a real eye-opener since you know, we started the Alliance. And I'd say 99% of our trade members have come from outside of the industry. And they've all come in with very keen business heads. Um, I mean, if you look at Mr. Jones Watches, who's based here in London, he had a, has an art background and he had an interest in printing. And over the years, that has developed into him creating a very successful brand, which is predominantly based on imports from you know, China and God knows where. But he's created a very successful business where he puts his own slant on that business and style on that business. He, he brings in artists to help create all the different dials and so on. And he, he's creating a very unique 
thriving business. And that, for me, is exciting because um, we lost the industry back in the um, 1850s and we lost it because we didn't move with the times, because we were still trying to make everything by hand. And we said no, we said no to mass production. And that's how we simply lost the, lost the, the industry. So the idea of going back there is just a non-starter. You can't build an industry or buy hand-making components. Um, we make 15, 18 watches a year. We're a good example as to how you know <laughs> how not to do how, how not to bring back an industry, but um, yeah, you know, and as I say, we're under no illusion. You know, there are people out there who are probably of our seventy-five trade members. There are people who will be really struggling, really struggling, trying to build watches in their in their bedrooms, um, who are hundred percent reliant on importing. Uh, components to create their watches but I started in my bedroom and actually it's in a garage actually I started in a garage and you know you got to start from somewhere so I think if we can all support these people buy their watches and the great thing is you know you you get to know these watchmakers well they're not often not watchmakers but they all have their own interesting story and um, that's what I've found so fascinating about the last few years involved in the Alliance is hearing about these people and getting to know about why they are making their watches and that's yeah really exciting and you know entry level is a few hundred quid yeah you know so you can buy many of these things (laughs) I I, I find it a touching almost that you you make watches that cost an amount that I definitely can't afford but you are there supporting an industry that starts at, I think Mr. Jones watches start at 150 pounds. Yeah. And they're, they're fantastic, yeah. so it's, yeah. it's really good. Um, mm-hmm. Question time. I'm sure you all have questions for Roger. From a fellow Boltonian, um, you mentioned about keeping your tradition going, talking to educators. I was just wondering, has, is there an apprentice for the watchmaker's apprentice? Um, and if there is one, do you want one years old? Oh. <laughs> um, what's your health record like? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have, um, yeah, w- one of the proudest things about what we've created over in the Isle of Man is, is our team of watchmakers. We have um, 15 people in the business, two engineers, and 10 of those people are at the bench building watches and they're all very young and they're all phenomenally keen and um, yeah I think that there are more and more I think the more high-tech we become in this world the more digitized we become I think there are more people who are wanting to get that hands-on experience who are being turned away from mass production and so on and so yeah we're very privileged we're very lucky to get a, you know, some really bright, the brightest watchmakers in, in Britain today. So it's very exciting. So yeah, there is a future. It's just not you, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> a bit harsh. <laughs> Anna, um, in your workshop, um, how difficult is it to kind of let the team get on and do the work and to be at your standard without you coming in and going, oh, I want to do that, I I can do that a little bit better, or obviously you trust them indefinitely. How difficult is it to step back and and let them run with it? Um, Yeah, I mean, I I think over the years, you know, we've built up a philosophy within the team. You know, there is that understanding as to the standard that they have to achieve. I always sort of say, um, when they're finishing a component, it's, it's either right or wrong. There is no in between. It's never. It's okay. Yeah. Um, and once they understand that, you know that that's that sort of works well. Um, but they are all incredibly driven to attain that standard and that level. They want the very best. And actually, sometimes I have to say no. That is good enough. You know, you have to, that is fine, move on to the next component and start working on that. So it's kind of self-policing, I would say. 
Which is great, wonderful. So this is obviously a watch finder event, so I think it's fair that I ask about secondary market prices. <laughs> um, and obviously, very recently, I think your Series 1 hit a record for a, a watch with your name on it, and shortly after that, you had a Series 2 that performed very well. And I guess, based on that info, um, I had two questions. The first would be, how do you take that, you know, that occurring, that performance of your watches in the secondary market, and does it, you know, affect what you do in the workshop or your team? And the second of which, uh, the second of my questions would be around, obviously I think right now I'm correct in saying your wait list is, is closed, sort of your books are closed, but when they were open or when they maybe will be open in the future, um, how do you go about determining, you know, which person is a genuine collector that loves what you do, the art and the effort you put into it? versus someone who sees the auction prices and maybe wants to get hold of your watch and then, you know, set it on in a few years? Um, yes, I mean, yeah, as you say, the, the prices have, <coughs> yes, gone up considerably of late. And uh, I don't know, it's, uh, for me, it's, it's all about the watchmaking. That's what really drives me. Of course, the increase in prices is very nice. Unfortunately, we don't see much of that. Um, on the secondary market, but yeah, it's it's hugely gratifying, and I suppose supports what we're trying to achieve. S sorry, yeah, it, it's self-determining actually. Um, th the sheer wait, you know, we have people waiting seven years, maybe eight years for some of our watches, and that is actually self-selecting. Um, you know, we we don't have the clients who just want to put down some money, and we don't get those clients who expect the watch to be delivered straight away and that seems to weed out the sort of speculators really um, which is great it just works very nicely yeah I'd be happy to wait for 20 years if, if you did a 20 year 0% finance term <laughs> 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 so from what I understand George strived to get Caraxial into the Swiss watch market yep. um, yeah. and maybe were the ones who picked it up uh, with your advancements, is that something? Do you have the desire to push your advancements and, and see if you can get it adopted into the wider watch market? Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm not pushing for that. Certainly not pushing for that. Um, it, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Um, today, the Amiga are the only other brand who use the coaxial escapements. Um, yeah, which is sort of, um, you'd like to think all manufacturers would use it. But um, I think the thing is today, you know, these watch brands are very much focused on their own identity. And um, I know that Coac the Amiga spent, I think I remember hearing, five, six million back in the mid-90s to develop the coaxial. And I think it's just become so identified with Amiga that perhaps others may be reluctant to take it on. Um, as for people taking on my improvements to the coaxial, well, um, actually, I, um, I recently bought one of the new uh, Speedmasters, the coaxial Speedmasters with the eight, uh, what is it? Is it 3861 movement? Is it? I'm hopeless with numbers, yeah. And um, I'd had it for several months, and I thought one day I'll have a look at the coaxial. Anyway, I noticed they've got the single wheel coaxial in there. So whether, who knows, I'd like to think Ooh. they took my idea. That'd be great <laughs> if they did, but um, anyway, it's there. And yeah, so that's, that's nice, that's great. You'll have to make your own moon swatch in retaliation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Talked about how you always want to prove and with the watchmakers in your workshop, you, you have to draw the line with um, like good enough. So, and how you improve on the coaxial, the, the two-wheel thing, what is one problem that is bugging you right now and you are thinking about how to resolve it? Um, like. Yeah, we, we, we started, it's probably the, um, we started work before the first lockdowns, uh, working with um, 
um, Manchester Metropolitan University. And we started working on um, trying to remove lubrication from a mechanical wristwatch. That's the last sort of, if you like, holy grail for mechanical timekeeping. I mean, even um, Brege back in his day was saying, give me the per perfect lubrication and I'll give you the perfect watch. So I'm saying, let's remove the lubrication and then I'll give you the perfect watch. So that's sort of where we're working and we're just about to restart that program actually uh, with MMU to um, kickstart it and you know start pushing in that direction to hopefully remove some or all of the lubrication from a mechanical watch. We don't know, we'll see wh where it takes us, but that's, that's my next thing. Well, there you go. I hope all those seats are comfortable. These uh, stools certainly are. <laughs> I want to say thank you, a massive, massive thank you, Roger, for coming and talking to us. Pleasure. Uh, a, a huge privilege. I hope you've all enjoyed it as well. Um, and uh, any last words? Sign up for the British Alliance, that oh, kind yes. of thing. Oh, yes. All of you, please sign up. <laughs> no, actually, seriously, all, if you could all join, then it makes our life a lot, lot easier. Yeah. Um, it's all been self-funded um, to this point. Um, yeah, and we can do great things with that. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.